There we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for this workshop, this pre-convention workshop on the Saturday afternoon. We're very excited to have you spending an hour with us. Um, you are, if you don't know, you are in the locally Haiti workshop. If you um, are in the right place, awesome. If you aren't, well, we hope that you stay with us because we've got a very exciting workshop for you. Um, Locally, Haiti has been a Jubilee ministry of the Episcopal Church in Colorado and partnering with Petty Troop for 34 years. Wynn has been the director for the past six years, and Father Bruce has been volunteering for, for a handful of years as well. So we are excited to have you here. They've got a great presentation for you. It's going to be laid back, conversational, but there's going to be a lot of awesome material that is covered. So welcome, gentlemen. Take it away. Thank you so much. Um... And thank you, Father Bruce, for being here. I'm excited to go through this together. Um, and uh, Father Bruce and I were just chatting. And since it's a small group, uh, we'd love to really take advantage of that and really kind of make sure that, of course, we have sort of a framework for the presentation and, and the PowerPoint and some slides we want to share. Um, but we'd really love for it to be as conversational as possible, as interactive as possible, and the benefit of having this kind of manageable number um, should really allow us to do that. So we were thinking if it's okay with you all, um, we'd love you all to introduce yourselves uh, briefly, uh, maybe with just a word about what attracted you to this um, webinar and, and what you were hoping to sort of either add to this conversation, get out of this conversation, or, or just kind of where you're coming from. Um, if it's okay, I think maybe the easiest would be so we don't have that awkward waiting where we're just seeing who's going to speak next. I'm going to pick someone, and then if you're okay speaking, please do, and then pick the next person um, so that that next person doesn't have to wait. Um, Daphne, would you be okay introducing yourself? Um, Father Bruce was saying that uh, you just seem to sort of be following him around. He's not quite sure who you are. I don't know if if you could shed some light exactly. on Yeah, I'm like a little puppy. B. Hoverstock obviously said she followed Raul around like a little puppy. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I, I probably heard of Colorado Haiti Project before, many years before, but then Bruce um, became involved after he was ordained. And so I've learned a lot. And, and now that we've been at St. Mary Magdalene for about seven years, there's that strong relationship um, with locally Haiti and St. Mary Magdalene, which has been lovely. And I've, I'm in awe of your leadership. I will say that right now. <laughs> so, so thank you for being, being here and doing that for Haiti. Um, and I will pick Reverend Michelle Danson. Thank you, Daphne. Um, I've been a supporter of the Haiti Project that used to be since the 90s, I think, um, as a regular donor, small amount every month, but it adds up. And then um, <clears throat> I actually went to Haiti, I think it was January 2018, um, on one of the trips um, with uh, Teresa from Mary Magdalene. That was very meaningful. So I, I'm, I'm on this call because I just want to support what you're doing. And I, I agree completely with what Daphne says. You're doing an awesome job, Wynne. And um, I'm so thrilled that you are who you are and you're doing this. Um, so um, I have like this much, I mean, I don't mean this much support. I have a lot of support, but it's only little compared to what you're all doing. And I'm, I'm just here to support it because I think it's, um, yeah. I think it's great. And not only what you do, but how you do it, the respect that you have for the Haitian people that um, we're in community with. I, I really appreciate that. And uh, I'd invite Deborah. Thank you, Mother Michelle. Appreciate that. Deborah Lowry, I'm a member of Chapel of Our Savior, and so have known about the Colorado Haiti Project from Father Dale Casey, Ed Morgan and Father LaFontante from the very beginning. Um, I've been a member at chapel since 1965, so have known Dale his whole tenure at Chapel of Our Savior. Um, and I would start by please asking everybody to pray for him. Um, he's 
dying. Um, he's got leukemia and um, is home on hospice care and just only has energy to sleep and visit with his wife, Judy, and their boys, Ethan and Aaron. Um, and I don't know if there would have been a Colorado Haiti project if it hadn't been for Dale and Ed um, connecting with Father LaFontante. I've always been a big supporter. I've never been called. I've never felt I was called to go to Haiti, um, but have supported through our parish. And the reason I'm here today, other than to share with you all about uh, Father Dale, is just to find out a little bit more about what's happening now and continue to support it and share that uh, with the members at chapel who are very passionate. And I think Haiti needs us now more than ever. Um, just, yeah. Thank you. And how about Nancy Congiardo? Congiardo. It's Congiardo. Um, okay. Yes, thank you. Um, I am from St. David of the Hills in Woodland Park. And I've, I've known of the Haiti Project for years and probably have supported it here and there, but uh, not to a full extent. Um, so I thought it would be interesting to learn more about it. And that's why I'm here. And let's see. Um, don't see. How about Rhoda Yaker? All right. I um, I currently attend St. Barnabas in Cortez, Colorado. I've lived here five and a half years now. I moved from Lakewood, Colorado, where I attended St. Joseph's. And we had several presentations on the Haiti Project the 22 years that I attended St. Joseph's and I had just totally lost touch and was kind of wanting to know what was happening again, because I had always been impressed with the diocese coming behind one place pretty much and providing support. You could see the presentations we had, you could see the difference it made with the medical missions and stuff for the children and the schooling and the community getting together. And I've just been always impressed with that. So thank you for those who are still working there. Also, I don't know whether you can hear me or not. I We don't have really good internet access and it keeps going in and out today, so. Thank you, Rhoda. Well, I hear you great. I hope everyone else does too, but mm -hmm. no connection issues here. And then maybe John, would you mind going next? Hi, I'm John Breed. I'm uh, from St. Bartholomew's in Estes Park and was uh, dear friends with uh, Father Morgan. And, uh, of course, no Dale Casey, uh, not Dale, but you, uh, right. And uh, Linda Davidson. So just trying to get kind of an update since we've been a little bit away from it at St. Bartholomew's for a while. Um, I have, uh, was attempted to go in 1991, but developed a, on the route, en route, um, uh, had to be taken to the hospital in Houston. And, but, um, have been, you know, trying to stay up to date with the Haiti project since that time or locally Haiti. And um, um, this year too, and uh, especially since um, um, Ed passed away, just it kind of was renewed into my brain. And I know Sarah is uh, still actively uh, kind of involved with the program as is Linda Davidson. So just wanted to kind of catch up. I also have another weird connection to Haiti through, uh, I lived in France my junior year in college, and my French brother worked for with as a French uh, bureaucrat with an agriculture program in Port-au-Prince, too. So I'd always thought that I would, if I went to Haiti, I would see him. He's since retired, but at that time, in 1991, he was still there. And one of the things that started with Ed Morgan, when it started from uh, St. Bartholomew's, was uh, one of the people here because uh, Father Morgan was wondering, you know, whether or not whether we should do it, whether uh, St. Bart should kind of go all in on it at that time, too. And 
one of his dear friends, uh, one of his golfing buddies said, well, isn't that what Christianity is all about, is to serve? And that's really uh, kind of crystallized Ed's thought at that point. Oh, and I'll call on Terry Abbott. Terry, um, are you able to introduce yourself next? Sorry, my internet is in and out and in and out today. Uh, I'm Terry Abbott from Trinity City, and I went to be in, uh, I think, Ninety-two with Ed and Dale, and I think I'm frozen. No, nope, you're not. Oh, okay. You're all frozen on mine. So, um, and I. Terry, if you actually turn off your video, your internet oh, will have a little uh, bit more Rhoda. bandwidth. Yes. I are yeah. <laughs> I understand your problems with the internet. I've been yeah. having the same problem. Yeah. So. Terry, can you hear me, Terry? Yes. If you turn off your you. video, your internet, okay. yeah, will take less bandwidth, and we'll get your Alrighty. audio more consistently. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I believe Chris is our last. Uh, hello, all. Uh, Chris Nazar from Church of the Ascension. Uh, good to see everyone today. Apologize for being a little slow. We were just finishing up parish work day at Ascension, so I had a little bit of a transition here. Um, I've been involved with Locally Haiti, Haiti for about a decade um, since coming to Colorado and, and to Ascension. I have been to Haiti seven times, twice with um, Locally Haiti, once on the trip that um, Michelle Danson went on, and then we had a uh, more of an Ascension, it's Ascension Denver based trip, um, what, 2019. Um, and then five times with a parish in Kansas City, which also has a, a partnership in Southern Haiti. Um, so uh, I think I'm fairly up to date, um, working with win on an event in December, um, but here just to make sure I'm supporting um, this effort. Great, well, thank you all. Um, and yeah, that event at Ascension in December is gonna be a, a Haitian market with lots of uh, goods and things, uh, paintings, art from, from sa for sale uh, from Haiti. We're excited about that and grateful to Ascension for hosting that. Um, and thank you all for introducing yourselves and, and sharing contacts. Um, one thing I did just want to note, um, Deborah, I'm talking to Judy tomorrow, and I've been in touch with Ethan, um, and sort of trying to, um, you know, just suss out what the most appropriate way to share an update is with folks. I, I, I obviously don't want to bother them, and but also want to defer to whatever they feel like the most appropriate way to share an update with a lot of longtime supporters and friends and folks that obviously care deeply about Dale and, and the family. Um, so thank you for noting that. And I would just say, I think it was you that said you're not sure if there would be um, a locally Haiti, Colorado Haiti project without Dale, Dale and Ed. And I would say it's quite certain that there wouldn't be. Um, and, uh, you know, we, uh, at least over the last six years, I've really kept very, very closely and deeply in touch with Dale, with Ed, um, and their families, and it's been a huge support to me. And and obviously, we work really hard to sort of, in essence, continue and build upon that legacy. So thank you for for noting that. Uh, sure. May I say just a couple of words? Sure, of course. Just for your information, um, Dale has been fighting leukemia for a few months now, and it's not the worst, but it's not. The kind, I don't remember the specifics, but it's not the kind that is more easily cured um, and middle of the road. And he did pretty well for a while and was really able to spend quality time with the people around them that they love. And um, then just very recently uh, went downhill pretty quickly, was in the hospital, had an infection, um, and 
he just didn't want to fight with the medication anymore. Um, he wanted to go home and be on hospice care. And he is, he's ready. I mean, I, I don't know if a priest can be more ready than any of us, but, uh, you know, the, the walk that, uh, that priests take. And, um, and so that puts my heart at comfort, but I know it's terribly difficult um, for Judy and Ethan and Aaron. Yeah. And many of us. Yeah, I've been in touch with Janet Hurst too. I don't know if you know Janet and Jerry well, but I know they just visited with them yesterday. And one of my best friends. Yeah, and I know that it's very hard for them too right now, as I'm sure. You, yeah. Well, thank you for sharing it, Deborah. And and as I've told them, just thinking of you and sending love and prayers. And there's a, a word in Haiti. I've written about this a little bit, but you know, it's courage, which is in essence the translation for courage. But in Haiti, it means so much more than that, in my experience, and it's all—it's always sort of kind of shared in these moments, which are faced all the time in Haiti, either on the on the front side or the other side. And and courage is, you know, sort of like a mix of of courage and condolence and faith and and you know all of that put together, um, you know, on steroids. And uh, and that's what I just continue to share with the family and share with you as well. Thank you. Um, and so, you know, to, to think about Dale and Ed obviously um, is really intimately and intricately, uh, you know, it's the foundation basically for what we're talking about today, which is partnership and, and what that partnership can look like and what it can lead to and how we can continue to honor it. Um, I'm thrilled that Father Bruce uh, agreed to participate um, and uh, give the sort of uh, parish uh, partner perspective and what it's meant to St. Mary Magdalene. And I know it's meant a lot to him personally. Um, so I think I'm just going to go ahead and, and get out of the way for right now. And, and if that's okay with you, Father Bruce, hand it over to you and then come back and share a little bit of an update on, on what we're up to, but also the current situation in Haiti and how that affects what we're up to. Um, and hopefully we can just have a conversation from there. Thanks, Winch. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm really glad we had a chance to hear from you about your interest in Haiti and in the Colorado Haiti Project. So it sounds like a lot of you have a lot of long-term experience there. The, some of the themes that Wynne had asked me to touch on, one is what difference has it made to St. Marie Magdalene to have as a parish to have such a long-term involvement with the Colorado Haiti, Colorado Haiti Project. Um, and one of the contexts for that was to do some kind of theological reflection on that um, and also how our partnership has grown and evolved over time. Uh, but you all have your own stories with your own relationships with the Haiti Project as well. One of the things that we were thinking was maybe there's some people who, you know, might be interested in engaging in uh, long-term partnerships of some sort, and this could be sort of a lessons learned um, kind of opportunity where we might share some of our experience and then we could all kind of pitch in and do some brainstorming about that. Um, so what I think I'm going to do just to begin is tell you a little bit about St. Mary Magdalene's history and where we are now and a little about my personal history. So I'll begin with that. Um, I was ordained out of St. John's in Boulder, as was Michelle Danson. And uh, when I was a parishioner there, before I went to seminary, I went to, to seminary in 2006, uh, the Colorado Haiti Project was already underway. And there were a couple of key people, such as Pat Ladicio and Evan, and Lynn, uh, Evan Carsey, Lynn Gilbert, and others who were very active in the early stages. And in fact, there were two St. John's parishioners who were the first um, directors once it started to incorporate as a nonprofit and had need for things like staff and offices and St. John's was part of that. So um, I was pretty familiar with it before I went to seminary. I uh, came out of seminary, was ordained to the priesthood. I served a parish in Kentucky for three years. I came back in 2012 and uh, Evan and Lynn invited me out for coffee and, and Pat, I guess, Evan, Lynn and Pat. And they asked me to be on the board. And I said, yeah, that sounds like a great idea, partly because I would love serving on a board with them. 
And I've done other kind of international work in other contexts as well, including in Zimbabwe and Cameroon. And uh, I said, sure. And then uh, right away, I found out they were both retiring from the board. So it was a little bit of bait and switch there. Um, <laughs> I, I still love them dearly. Uh, but that be was the beginning of my adventure with the Haiti Project. So I was a board member. My first trip to Haiti was in January of 2013, which, or it might have been 14. Whatever year was the 25th anniversary, would that have been 14? It was probably 14, yeah, which was a big freaking deal. And uh, it was a great opportunity as my first time there. Um, it was a huge celebration that lasted for a week in Petit True. There were Episcopal, Haitian Episcopal churches coming from all over. They brought their choirs. Uh, they brought their clergy. Uh, it was really quite amazing and wonderful. Um, and after that, I was there two more times. Uh, the occasions were a little bit more subdued. Uh, the second time I was a chaplain to a group that was traveling there, which was really wonderful because we really got to kind of settle into uh, the Christian walk, as you were saying. I'm thinking about tomorrow's gospel. Uh, a uh, man had two sons. He asked one of them to go into the vineyard, and he said yes, but didn't go. He asked the other one and said no, but he changed his mind and went. Who was the one who did his father's will? Well, and that's exactly what this is. The people who, doesn't really matter what they say, but the people who do. So that was Dale and Ed, and that was a lot of people who end up going down there. It's just enacting what the Christian journey is all about. Um, and then the last time I was there, there was some, uh, I was there with a couple of folks, it was a very small group, and they were sort of scoping out some opportunities to expand some of the trips to Haiti to include young people. And we, it was the first time we actually went out to that the island that's off the coast there, uh, when that was uh, very interesting. So I was there with lots of, you know, different times. People have asked me, what do you do when you go there? And I say, I go to parties mostly. I like to go there for the Feast of St. Paul, not just because it's the last week in January, which is a perfect time to go, uh, but just because of the community celebration. And it's a great way to informally just be with people and learn about what they do, find out what's going on with the leadership in the community, report back to the, to the organization, that sort of thing. Um, so if, if you don't mind, I have like a two minutes little montage I wanna share with you. And it's uh, it's photographs from some of the different times I've been there. A lot of it was from that 25th anniversary. I was looking at it today. Um, really, it's very sweet. And especially in the context of what life is like in Haiti now, uh, it's, was, it's been really good for me to sort of uh, tap back into that, just to sort of see the, the beauty of the country and the beautiful people in the country. So I titled this Bel Pei Bel Moon, which uh, I think in Haitian Creole means beautiful country, beautiful people. And uh, I'll just let you watch this and then we can talk about it after. Okay, that didn't work. Try it again. You guys, share my screen. That is highlighted. Can you all see that? Yeah.
I could watch that all day. So a lot of you, I'm sure each one of you who've uh, been connected with the Haiti Project probably saw somebody in there that you recognize. But I'm just curious what it was like for you to see that. Uh, what, uh, what did you notice? What feelings came up for you? What does it remind you if, if you've been there? Thoughts, feelings? What do you, what do you see? What, what story did you see told there? I always hear about the smiles and that's what I saw. Um, mm -hmm. Just how happy the people are in the midst of what must be extremely difficult would definitely mm -hmm. be for any of us that mm -hmm. would be living there. Um, and their joy to worship. Yeah, as a priest in the Episcopal Church, and again, it's, it's an Episcopal diocese in the same church that we're in. Really amazing to see what a Book of Common Prayer service looks like in Haiti <laughs> and what it sounds like. And, you know, the fact that there's dancing involved. Very compelling. Anybody else? I want to say for me on that trip in particular, it was very powerful to be with Ed Morgan on that trip. And um, one of the things that was interesting about Ed is on that trip, he was saying, I had several conversations with him where he said, um, I'm not so sure I think uh, making the Colorado Haiti Project into a nonprofit organization was that good an idea. He said, my vision was always, or what we thought when we started it, was just a people to people kind of thing. So every once in a while, groups of Episcopalians from Colorado would go to Haiti, they'd meet people, they might do some service like medical missions or whatever. And he said that was really, he said, for me, that was the main thing, that it would be an opportunity for some sort of transformative encounter with people from different cultures, and it would just enrich people's spiritual life and their, their Christian walk. Um, but as the week went on and this celebration you saw was so amazing. And we did this, we honored um, the woman that we honored who I can't remember, Madame. Anyway, who's been a woman who's been very strong community leader and helping make the whole thing happen and the school happen. Uh, I remember on the way back, he was like, oh, I get it. <clears throat> He's like, the, the fact that it's actually an organization is what has sustained it over time. And it still has that same really vibrant people to people um, kind of aspect to it. People's lives are still changed by being involved there. Uh, and I was very honored that as we were leaving, he uh, actually gave me his stole because he said, I'm not sure I'll be coming back. He gave me his stole and then he did go back two or three times after that but I never gave him his stole back. I still have. Um, so that was an interesting point in the history of the, of the Haiti project, for sure. Anybody else have a feeling or a response to watching that video? One of the things I noticed was it was kind of like a celebration of water, being able to drink the water oh. from, yeah, the source <laughs> when they were getting it. Yes. And I know that, Colorado Haiti Project had worked on wells with them. That's right. To make it more convenient for the people. I remember yeah. the wells and the school, everything there, just seeing it all there. And then, well, to me, seeing it. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> yeah, no problem. But, uh, and the cross cultural. Mm -hmm. But we don't, I don't think we do even enough of that in the United States here. Yeah. <laughs> To have Good point. one servant, you know, one God, mm -hmm. all, yeah. you know, worshiping one God all together. And it looked like so many of those people were getting maybe ready to be baptized, were they? Or was I mm. incorrect in that? Uh, there were some confirmations. Yeah, okay. I don't know about baptisms, yeah. Um, I wanted to say a word about the well, because that was another important developmental point in the history of the Colorado Haiti Project, which is as the as the project started to evolve from 
kind of one-off medical missions into more of a comprehensive or systemic view of, well, how are we supporting this community when we're not here? And as the relationships and the friendships started to deepen, the thinking about what we were doing there started to change. And that was one of the first projects was uh, the kids who go to St. Paul's school, they come from villages all over that area. And how many people are from that catchment area when it's like 13,000 or something? Uh, the entire commune is now 40,000. 40,000. So no. the question is all the kids who come there, do they have access to clean water? Because access to clean water means they have time to go to school instead of spending four hours a day fetching water from a well or from a stream somewhere. So that was one of the first projects that really started to, to build it out. Um, I wanna just say a word um, from my perspective at St. Mary Magdalene about what's happening from our parish level. So I was on the Haiti board until 2016 and coincidentally, six months later, I became the rector at St. Mary Magdalene, which had this long-term relationship with the Colorado Haiti Project. So there were several people that you saw there that are members of, of, of St. Mary Magdalene. So when I went there, there was already this expectation and this tradition that the, Haiti, uh, the people of Petit Trudenib are a, the primary focus for our international uh, mission outreach. And uh, one of those people is Teresa Henry, who's a, been a program person uh, staff at the Haiti Project. And um, so she kind of keeps it, keeps it going. But our parish has every year has a fundraiser or two for the Colorado Haiti Project. And we have done a fundraiser for scholarships at the school. And almost every year we do it, we're able to sponsor an entire class of kids. This year we sponsored an entire uh, kindergarten class, um, and, which has been fantastic. So that's an ongoing thing. Um, there have been times when there have been periods of crisis or immediate need in Haiti, where when we've asked ourselves, what is ours to do? Our answer has been, we can pray for our friends like we would for anyone else. And so we've had prayer vigils for people in Haiti. The last one was actually just earlier this year and we ended up doing it online as a Zoom uh, kind of situation. And Wynn had was able to show videos of some people from Petty True who were talking about what it was like there and their hardship, but also their hope. Um, I think that's where that theme, we are here came from. Uh, when Wynn was asking them, how are you doing? And they said, we are here. Um, again, in hard times and in good times, that's the thing about these partnerships, they will break your heart. Um, you will suffer with people that you've come to love when you deepen this way. And I think a lot of people who are engaged in this kind of work often have to decide if they're going to, um, you know, if they want to stay with it when things, you know, go south or things aren't quite so good. And, but after a while, especially well, those of you here, for example, um, you don't really have a choice to abandon the people in Haiti anymore because you've developed this sort of personal connection. You're not going to give up on them. And when people say to you, why would you ever be involved in a place like Haiti? It's just hopeless. You have stories to tell people. Um, the kind of capstone for our involvement was a capital campaign project we did in 2019, 20, and 21 at St. Mary Magdalene. We did a total refurbishing of the church and the campus. Um, it ended up being a million dollar capital campaign. And from the beginning, our decision was that we were going to make a 10% tithe to support our outreach. Uh, that's an expectation at St. Mary Magdalene, very invested in outreach historically. And it was immediately clear that that was going to go to the, to, uh, the Colorado Haiti Project, now locally Haiti, for their capital needs, because they had uh, the, the school campus there had buildings that had been damaged by earthquakes, were no longer safe to be in. And then right in the middle of that, and when you can say more about this if you want to, but the funds that we were giving um, were available to help rebuild and to build new uh, structures. And after another um, hurricane came through there. Um, so that was really meaningful. And I have to tell you that was, our church felt a huge sense of accomplishment, just be, not just because of what we did for our capital needs, but what we did uh, for our friends' capital needs too. I like the word that Michelle used, the people that we're in communion with. It, it does feel that way, that we are in communion with the people, the people of Petty True. 
Um, I think I am going to stop there and then you see if you have any questions about that. And then when I know you're, you're going to want to um, make sure you have a chance to update people on what's happening there now. One thing I um, sort of heard in the a theme here is <clears throat> this idea of pilgrimage. And I think that that is what has happened over the years. Yes. Um, in what uh, Ed and Dale actually started. That's um, right. And I'm really... And pilgrimage is sort of becoming more of an emphasis again in the diocese. Um, we know there's lots of trips um, to do the Camino, et cetera. But, but I've also been thinking about how, how do we understand pilgrimage um, in terms of going to places like Haiti or going to the border or going to places of uh, where a different kind of pilgrimage per experience perhaps occurs for us. Um, mm -hmm. And I know Haiti's a, a tricky right now to maybe <laughs> travel to. To say the least. Hopefully yeah. at some point that could happen again. But yeah. I, but I, I really, uh, as as a spiritual act, a pilgrimage mm -hmm. is such an important thing, and and I really want to honor the pilgrimage sort of sensibility and yeah. history here, and also to keep keep that in mind for the future. Yeah. Thank you, Daphne. Um, when I was on the board, one of the things that we worked on was reframing the trips that we take down there. And we, we it was reframed from mission to pilgrimage for exactly that reason, that it's not, you know, us going down and doing things for people or bringing things to people that we think they don't have, but acknowledging that it's for us too. It's a journey for us, a spiritual journey to basically um, find understanding that we don't bring Jesus anywhere, that Jesus has always gone before us. So going somewhere that's unfamiliar to find where Jesus is in those places and incorporating that into our, our walk. Um, Mary Magdalene actually is in a similar situation in recent years. Uh, we wanted to start going down to the border on a regular basis because it's close and because we're in the Southwest, it affects us culturally, political, economically, where we live. And we wanted to frame those as pilgrimages for that exact same reason. And also because we wanted to do them regularly to sort of follow what's happening down there and build relationships with people that are working there in the same kind of way that we learned from, from the Colorado Haiti project. Uh, and the other thing now I would say, Haiti. When, when you speak, I would love um, to just remind everybody why you changed the name to Locally Haiti. And because that's really important. There was a very intentional reason around relationship. Sure. Um, well, thank you, Father Bruce, and thank you, Daphne, as well. Um, yeah, a couple, two things that I'll um, just kind of focus on real briefly, and then I'm going to kind of fly through a PowerPoint because I do want to just take a chance to update you all on actually what's happening, what, what we're supporting through local leaders and through local institutions. And then I think at the end, I'll just talk for a minute about the current situation in Haiti and how that overlaps with our work and our partnership. Um, and then I think that should leave a few minutes just for questions and conversation. Um, one thing I just wanted to note briefly because Father Bruce brought it up, um, the tithe on the capital campaign um, was even more generous than Father Bruce described, actually. Um, and the timing was actually, we were in this moment where we, several groups of engineers had identified that the school that had been built was unsafe. And it's not that we started that capital campaign because of an event. We started that capital campaign because we knew, and Father Bruce referenced this as well, that we wouldn't want our own children in that school. And therefore, the only decision was to take that school down, even though it was difficult, it was gonna be hard to message, there were gonna be, you know, it was a lot of money, um, but we had to do it anyway for that same reason, because uh, once you're in that depth of a relationship and you have doubts about a structure, you know, you don't say, well, it'll probably be fine. And so we we actually rebuilt the school, thanks in large part to St. Mary Magdalene and others, before the earthquake of August 2021. And if we had not done that, it would have had really, really disastrous consequences. So not only the financial support, but
but the ability to count on partnerships, which are very, um, a real relationship allows you to have a, a, a difficult conversation. And to be honest, it was a difficult conversation to say, we have to take this school down and it's gonna be expensive and it would be easier to, to, to leave it up and to have an evacuation plan and to do, you know, but we're not gonna do that. And it was all the partnerships that exist across the diocese and within parishes that allowed us to have that conversation and take that difficult step and it saved lives. Um, and the other thing, uh, as far as the name goes, Daphne, I just don't wanna forget, um, that was done, um, because the Colorado Haiti project, and it's funny, Father Dale and Father Ed, you know, we had conversations about this. They were the first people that I talked to about this and then had a series of conversations afterwards. Both of them, you know, there was absolutely no resistance to the idea. And in fact, they both sort of, because they both have incredible sense of humor, as, as some of you all know, um, but they both sort of said, well, we didn't really give much thought to it. It was just, you know, um, it's just the first name that came out. Like they, there was no tie to the name. And the reason behind it, um, the change was just about what we lead with, you know, what what the work is about. And the work is about um, investing in, capacitating, believing in, trusting local people and local vision. And so to start, even though Colorado is still, you know, the home base for the vast majority of our, of our support, um, to start with Colorado and to refer to it as a Haiti project, even though there was never an intent necessarily to, to give that impression, you know, it gives it an impression that it's a thing that's starting here and it's a project that's there. And that's just not the way that we see it. And it felt important enough to go through a process to think through what, what is the appropriate phrase. Um, and so that's where we ended up there. I mean, I will say it does have a secondary benefit you know, of hopefully opening up other opportunities in other parts of the country or having other benefits, not, not that we're sort of opening offices, we don't even have an office here, um, or anything like that in other places. But, um, you know, I do think it's had some other benefits um, across the country, but that was not the reason to do it. The reason to do it was principle, and it was about who we are and, and whether and how our name reflects that. Um, and then just a, a final thing about St. Mary Magdalene and, and the things that Father Bruce mentioned, um, St. Mary Magdalene is, is one very impactful example of the kind of parish partnerships that really sort of define who we are and how we've grown and how we've been able to keep moving and evolving. Um, I was just at St. John's, I think at last week preaching, um, I'll be at St. Stephen's where we have our kind of like donated office next weekend. We're doing that event uh, at Ascension, um, and Ascension is a great long-term partner. That was the first, that was the last big trip we took um, before before COVID. It was an amazing group from Ascension. Um, there's parishes across the diocese that are truly deeply connected. And if your parish is interested in either reestablishing, deepening, having a conversation about what that might look like, I just want to note, I would absolutely love to talk to you about that. Um, anytime. So uh, it's a big part of who we are and what we do. And that's extended out to the diocese more, more broadly. Um, you know, lucky to have great relationships with, with Bishop Kim, um, Ken and Vanessa that, you know, come to events and are supportive and help us brainstorm on things. And then we also have received a few UTO grants um, and, uh, and a creation care grant for a mangrove conservation effort that we're engaged in. And then have recently been able to engage Episcopal Relief and Development, um, who are supporting community health workers and also um, the hospital project that you'll learn about. Um, so just to note, from the parish level and beyond, um, our Episcopal roots are, are healthy and thriving. And all of that starts with that founding story, and it starts also at the parish level. Um, I'm going to share this. PowerPoint. Um, and like I said, I'm just going to go through this pretty quickly um, because I want to leave time for conversation. Um, but so our history, we've we've talked about um, Father Dale, Father Ed, and Father Octave Lafontaine. There's an incredible founding story that if we have time, I'll uh, summarize it at the very end. 
Um, but people coming together, um, and even you know, from that very beginning, it was very much Father Dale and Father Ed were clearly leaders and clearly had a vision. And they were also deferential to Father Octav, and that was also baked into the roots. They were sort of saying, "What? Okay, what do we do? How can we help? What do we do next?" Um, and uh, as I understand it, the three of them had a very special relationship. Um, our mission statement there. Uh, let me just move this out of the way. Um, advocate for and invest in locally led initiatives to support the vision of our partner communities in rural Haiti. Um, these values are super important to us. Um, Mother Michelle mentioned not only the what of what we do, but the how of it. Um, and these values really re reflect that. And we take them very seriously. Um, we look at them at the beginning of board meetings. We have all of this translated into Creole and have shared it with all of our partners there. We uh, periodically sort of check in and, and in essence, ask how we're doing um, when it comes to these values. Um, so that relates to the how. Um, these are just some of the amazing people that we are lucky to partner with and support. Um, local leaders lasting impact is sort of part of our, um, that new logo, that locally Haiti um, name change. These are some faces that will seem familiar to you all. And then real briefly, just sort of theory of change, um, which really also relates to the current moment. And, and this was true even before things devolved to the extent that they've devolved in Port-au-Prince, um, but it's even more important than ever. Um, you know, the idea is basically to invest in these local institutions that we believe in, the, the Episcopal Church being sort of the first and foundational of them, but not the only one. Um, to basically focus on this one place where we have relationships, um, where we have uh, these partnerships, and that will allow Haiti to develop a, um, a multipolar economy where folks are not only with the options to go to Port-au-Prince or to emigrate often in dangerous ways, but where you can imagine these fertile places um, of such talent and such possibility um, through investment being places where you can raise a family, where you can deliver your baby in a healthy way, where you can have access to education and hope to have access and hope for work after that. Um, the journeys that folks are taking, um, uh, whether that's boarding a boat or going somewhere in South America and then traveling by land um, uh, that we see at the border, that no one takes those journeys um, because there's a different option. Um, they take those journeys because they are basically economic refugees and have no other possibility to support the children. That's what's happening. And so our work, and we hope that this model can exist all across the country and across the world, is to avoid those trips from the beginning by investing in the talents of those people in the communities that, that they live in and that they're from. Of course, we're not against travel. We're very much for travel, but we're against travel that comes um, as a result of no other possibility and uh, under dangerous conditions like that. So St. Paul's School, as you all know, uh, first and foundational uh, program that says 527 students, but it's actually 538 right now. There has been um, about an 18% increase in students over the past year. That's partially because folks are internally displaced from Port-au-Prince. I'll get to this later. But it is the case, uh, about 70% of Port-au-Prince is right now gang controlled. I was just there uh, for a funeral of a dear friend. Um, and the stories that you hear from Port-au-Prince are not sensationalism, they're not exaggeration. What's happening in the capital is, is truly tragic and in many cases unspeakable. And there are lots of people leaving Port-au-Prince to go to the rural parts of the country or sending children, grandchildren to the rural parts of the country where there are tons of challenges and where things are uh, being felt, the downstream effects of all what's happening in Port-au-Prince are being felt in the rural part of the country, but at least there's security and at least there's a measure of stability when it comes to violence and kidnapping and the issues that we're seeing in Port-au-Prince, but not in the rural part of the country. Um, so uh, not only is the population of St. Paul's growing, but it's happening across the commune of Petitru, and I'll speak a little bit more about that at the end. Um, but these are just a few stats about St. Paul's. Um, as I mentioned, uh, 538 students. We also have a higher education program where we support scholarships within the country. 
Um, recently that's happening in, in collaboration with Father Abiyad, um, the previous, well now two priests in charge ago that was pictured with Father Bruce. He's now the head of BTI, the Episcopal University in Lake High. And so we've been sending students there recently. Girls Empowerment and Mentoring. This happens in cooperation with a Haitian organization called Réponse Pouvoir, which means Rethink Power. Just to be clear, this is not something that we come up with here in Colorado and bring there. It's, it's made for the Haitian context. It's all done in Creole. It's all designed by um, activists in Haiti. It's based on um, a program and curriculum that was started in South Africa, but um, this uh, group, Le Ponce Pouvoir, has worked really closely with that curriculum based in South Africa and adapted it for the context. So it happens now in six different schools, including St. Paul's. Um, there are girls clubs. There are like dedicated um, trainings that deal with self-advocacy, communication skills, economic independence. Um, it's a creation of a response network and sort of overlaps to some extent with the community health work. It's a great program. Um, Agriculture and food security is, is a big part of what we do. Um, that functions at St. Paul's School through uh, agricultural education and gardening, farming program, but also with other community-based organizations in the region. At various points, it has involved seed banking, seed saving, demonstration gardens, irrigation systems. We're now doing beekeeping, um, animal husbandry. And it's all about local food systems. I mean, I, I don't want to... Um, we haven't solved the food security problem in Petit Tru. Um, across the country, folks are food insecure, folks are hungry, but we are making significant progress, making a significant dent through these local structures, basically helping to produce local food, um, both on home gardens and also in some slightly larger scale efforts. Um, and I mentioned that mangrove conservation program. I'm, I'm mindful of the time, so I'm sort of flying through this, but the mangrove conservation program, um, which was funded through the Episcopal, the Task Force on Creation Care through the Episcopal Church, um, engages uh, agronomists, community leaders, um, uh, schools, uh, education initiatives, and basically is trying to de-incentivize the cutting down of the mangrove forest. The mangrove forest um, has, there's ecosystem services it provides. It's a place where, you know, um, fish populations grow. But it also provides really important benefits when it comes to uh, resiliency of the coastline, soil conservation, um, resistance to storms. And so um, if you're interested in that, I can send you more information about it. Or if we have time, I can tell you more in the remaining period. And then community health, we support 40 community health workers. And that is um, through the um, local health department. Uh, the On the departmental level, um, so our department is NEEP. There are 10 departments in the country. We're Petit Tru de NEEP. So NEEP is like one of the 10 states, you could say, in the country. Um, and on the departmental level, um, they certainly are under-resourced, but it is a very, very different conversation when you're talking about the local government versus the federal government. I get this question a lot when, when I talk about our partnership with the local Ministry of Health, and people say, well, I thought there was no government in Haiti, really. Well, that's sort of true on the federal level, but on the local level, um, you know, the truth is they haven't been counting on the federal government in Haiti for a long time. And what that has uh, ended up with is local systems that take their responsibilities seriously, that are responsive to local people, that are very communicative, very eager for partnership. And so the work we do in health is mostly in coordination with the local clinic, which happens through the Ministry of Health, specifically in the NEEP area. And so we support these 40 community health workers, programs um, around uh, vaccinations, education, hygiene. Some of those happen in like mobile posts. Some of them happen in tents next to the clinic. Um, and uh, we also do training programs with traditional birth attendants. And there's a really, really promising, I think, an innovative program that was designed by folks in Petit Tru that has combined the work of community health workers with the work of agronomists so that these community health workers have done um, in the course of their normal work when they're engaging in these very rural areas. They're also doing trainings on, um, on local farming and agriculture. You know, um, there's seed banking and seed saving co-ops. There's tool banks, access to tools. Um, and so that has, uh, then I think a really promising thing, they call it the mariage, the marriage between agriculture and health 
And so that started as part of a COVID response, but I think it will continue to be a part of the way that we work. And that's just uh, a reference to that community health worker program um, that started after COVID and, and is continuing on now. And then uh, just real briefly, our, our biggest current challenge and opportunity is uh, the building of a new community hospital and health center to replace the one that was damaged in the earthquake of August 14th, 2021. Um, that column that you see there is inside the clinic. That building that you see is about a block away from the clinic. So the clinic did not fall completely to the ground, but it is absolutely unsafe. Um, they uh, are not using it. Um, they use it for storage and sort of run in and out every now and again. But even two years later, um, all of the healthcare is happening in tents like these that we actually brought down after the earthquake. It was a donation from Direct Relief, who is a partner. Um, and uh, it was meant to be a short-term solution. Um, that short term has turned into two years. Um, and we're about to break ground on the facility to, uh, to change that reality. Um, these are just uh, sort of renderings. Um, we're working with an architect named Masada who has done over 50 projects in Haiti and uh, in something like 40 countries throughout the world. They've been wonderful to work with. They have a full-time Haitian architect who's based in Haiti um, and has visited the site. Oh, it looks like that's the end. Um, so um, I'm heading to Haiti on uh, October 12th and uh, we'll be there for a little over a week. Um, we've gotten um, really, really, really close to signing the contract for that hospital project. Um, it's gonna be a very, very heavy lift for us. It's uh, a huge project for an organization of our size. Um, there are a lot of twists and turns to that story, but we've picked a contractor. They have amazing experience in the country. They have done projects in the South. They have a very detailed plan for how they're going to be able to transport materials, despite all of the challenges that you read about. Um, and uh, it's an incredibly exciting moment. Um, so I will be sort of taking some footage and recording simple videos while I'm there about the latest with the hospital project and look forward to sharing them with you all. Um, but that that is just sort of the broad strokes of the programmatic work all done by local leaders through local institutions that these partnerships support. And uh, what I'll just say, as far as the situation in the country goes and how all of what I just described relates to it, is again, I mean, we always, even under quote unquote normal circumstances, have this challenge of how do we show the other side of the reality in the country? How do we lift up and amplify voices that are brilliant and creative and every bit as, as human as you and I are um, and highlight the possible and highlight the positive and, uh, and give voice to those leaders without uh, minimizing the depth of the challenges? Um, how do we strike that balance? Because to tell the story of the challenges is complicated and there are long stories and then oftentimes they're sad stories. And, uh, and there's sort of enough of that out there already. You don't need to look very hard to find those headlines. Um, so it's always a challenge for us. How do we highlight the truth of the one side while not minimizing the other? And it's even more difficult right now because what's happening in Port-au-Prince, as I mentioned, is, is truly as bad as, as you're reading. I mean, um, when I was there a few weeks ago, um, there were 13 gunshot wounds that came into the hospital that I was staying at in one night. There was a full neighborhood behind the embassy that was basically completely evacuated because of gang activity. There were about 500 refugees uh, camped in front of the embassy, the US embassy um, for a period. Um, they were then basically made to leave and then were staying in a, in a public high school for a while. And actually the folks that I was with, we, we sort of brought them supplies and visited during that weekend that I was there. Um, there are uh, talks about a Kenyan force of a thousand going to Haiti soon to serve sort of a stabilizing role. Um, they wouldn't be there to uh, engage directly with the gangs. They would be there to protect certain sort of high priority sites and they would be seen as peacekeepers. Um, a lot of people in Haiti that 
that I know well and that are generally speaking opposed to the idea of foreign intervention are in support of something because it's just gotten so bad that it's hard to see a way out without some stabilizing force. Um, but we could do another hour and a half conversation about the history of interventions in Haiti, why there is real skepticism around that, um, the type of scars and calluses that are built up around that idea because of some pretty tragic things that have come as a result of those interventions. Um, and then also give a lot of time to uh, the reason why it's really necessary. So um, what I can say is it seems likely that that will happen um, soon, but it's not 100% definitive yet. And in the meantime, things in Port-au-Prince are uh, at a new level, is what I can say. When I travel to Haiti, um, I uh, stay at the hotel about 50 yards from the airport in Port-au-Prince and then take a domestic flight to, to Lake Haie, and then drive from Lake Haie to Petit True, back to Lake Haie, take a domestic flight from Lake Haie to Port-au-Prince again, because you just can't drive to Petit True from Port-au-Prince in the way that we always used to, in the way that I would much rather. Um, and that obviously is true also when we send uh, our colleagues that are that are based in Port-au-Prince, that's how they do it as well. They, they fly to Lake Haie and drive from there. Um, and so again, as I, as I noted earlier, People in Petit True feel the effects of what's happening deeply. It is traumatic in every way. Um, everyone knows people in Port-au-Prince or has history in Port-au-Prince. It's uh, a challenge, practically speaking, um, with the loss of the devaluation of the currency, with the inability to get around the country. There's also currently a, um, a big sort of drama at the border with the Dominican Republic, which has also affected the ability for certain goods to get in. Um, even the rural parts of the country are feeling the effects of what's happening very, very deeply. However, um, there are not safety, security, violence issues in Petit True. When you get to the countryside, when you get out to the countryside, it feels like Haiti. You know, you see the beauty, you, you hear the music, you engage with people in the same way that you always did. Um, but there is a sadness, there is a resignation, there is an exhaustion um, that is palpable at just the depth of the dysfunction and and atrocity, to be honest, that is occurring in Port-au-Prince. Um, everybody feels it very deeply. And so our work in Petit True is more important than ever. Um, the hospital project is an example of that. Um, there are things to be scared about in taking on a project of that size. Um, but we feel like it's really, really important um, to move forward with our partners. Um, it's been over two years that a population of 40,000 people have only tents as a place for their health care. Um, and thanks to parish partnerships, thanks to generosity, we've made a ton of progress in being able to fund that. We have a ways to go, but we have enough to move forward and break ground with a lot of hope and a lot of faith and a lot of strategy that we will get there. Um, and so that's uh, the short version, shortish, sorry. And I think I'll pause there and uh, just ask for feedback, questions, thoughts, or Father Bruce, if, if anything um, came up for you while I was uh, going through that, then feel free to chime in. But please engage, would love this to be a conversation. And thank you for being here again. When, how much more money do you have to raise for the hospital? So uh, in hand or committed is 1.2 million and the total project is 1.9. Okay. Um, so the gap and our ability to close that gap is based on projections. It's based on some hopeful opportunities. It's based on some gifts that are committed for next year. Um, so it feels reasonable to move forward, but uh, it is really stressful. And that is a very serious gap and a big number. Um, and so, like I said, it's it's not um, only with faith that we're moving forward, but faith is part of it. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking as we're all sitting here, as there's um, just having more and more of the parishes involved in understanding 
what this project is. Yeah. And I'm sure you're doing as much as you can, but I would love to see that more parishes get engaged to support this. Yeah. Yeah. We see it as an opportunity, honestly. I mean, this is a place that is one of the hardest places in the world to really make an impact um, and a project that people can understand and, and it's very tangible. And so we see it as a great opportunity, not only to engage with existing partners, but hopefully um, new ones as well. And we're, we are working on that for sure. I was gonna say at a time like this, you know, a lot of people would be asking, they always usually do anyway, but why would you bother trying to help people in Haiti or some version of that? Like, oh, it's so messed up and they can't get their act together and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But for you to try to raise $1.9 million now in the current context to build a hospital is so crazy that it like has to be a faith-based kind of thing. Like, how could you not do it if you didn't think there was some miracle in store, you know, that, you know, God is with you somehow. I mean, you're sort of showing your faith by even going in this direction and making your own commitment to it. Yeah, it's sort of how could you, and the answer is how could you not? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll just say it's great to see those of you that I already know and those of you that um, this is the first time saying hello. Please do reach out if, if you have any questions, any thoughts, if you think there might be an opportunity to engage, you know, with your parish or with your network. Um, and uh, just so appreciate all of you making time to be a part of this and for believing in, in what we're doing. And, and please know that you're invited enthusiastically um, to engage in any way that, that you might be interested in. Thank you so much. Um, I'd just mm -hmm. like to make a comment. I was really struck, Bruce, when you said with your capital campaign, you tithe 10% um, mm -hmm. to Haiti. And I just think that's such a both and thing because so many people are resistant to um, giving money for a capital campaign because, you know, we're so fortunate. And I really would like, I don't know how it would be, but for it to be more generally known amongst the clergy that mm -hmm. actually this is, and because I'm sure, I would think that people would be more willing to give because mm -hmm. Um, exactly. it's going somewhere else as well. It's it's not mm -hmm. just about us fortunate white people that happen to live in, you know, wealthy yeah. environment. And um, and also when what Bruce has said about um, this really is a model of stepping out in faith. And, um, and when people see those photographs and those images of those people who have every right to have safe water, good education and good health care. Um, how can we not help them? Um, yeah, thank you. I'm Go ahead, John. John, I think you were not muted and then you accidentally muted yourself. Um, Still muted. John, you're muted right now. Sorry, I think when... we're yeah. playing mute tag. There you go. There you go. Uh, um, I think Father Bruce told us how you he got involved, but we don't know exactly how you got involved originally. Uh, very and very I good. just found you on I just found you on Instagram too, by the way. <laughs> Um, I only have like a, a ghost Instagram account to watch my son's soccer. Um, I, don't, oh. I don't post anything. Um, but um, my very short is I, I lived in Haiti for two and a half years in 2010, 11, and 12. And what brought me there was the earthquake of, of 2010. I had been living in Peru for the year before, and they sort of asked me to come for a short period to help with some things. I ended up staying. And then um, really, it's my sons that, that brought me to 
the Colorado Haiti project now locally Haiti because um, I adopted my two sons from Haiti. Um, they ended up at St. Louis uh, Catholic School in Louisville um, because we needed a private school by the nature of their visas. It's a long story. Um, but uh, I was in Louisville and walked by the office and saw a Colorado Haiti project on the door. And uh, so I went in and said hello. And eventually it, it, it led, led me here. <laughs> you should have been on the last workshop because that's what we talked about there. <laughs> Michelle, I wanted to say just a couple of quick things about your comment. It, so from at St. Mary Magdalene, for a number of years, they uh, gave 10% of their operating budget to go to gifts for outreach. And uh, so that's always been really strong, uh, strong e ethic there. But over the years, that's been harder and harder to do to take it out of the operating budget. But there's still this idea that 10% number and the idea of giving to others as part of what you know what we're giving to the church was so strongly ingrained that uh, the folks on the planning committee for the campaign said, if we don't do something for outreach, people are going to wonder why why it wouldn't be there. And so it actually, I think it very much was uh, an idea that would draw more people to it, uh, be, to be more generous. I think there were people who added to their campaign tie to their campaign gift to cover that 10% uh, that was going to go to Haiti. But um, I, one reason I was actually familiar, familiar with that, and I was able to talk about the experience at St. John's. Um, I don't know if you remember when the Ed Wing was built at St. John's, they tied 10% to the carriage house, a day shelter for homeless. And that St. John's actually funded most of that renovation to create that day shelter out of their 10% tithe to capital campaign. So kudos to St. John's too. And Mother Michelle, just to your point, um, I've actually chatted with Father Bruce. We haven't got too far on it yet because I think, uh, well, I guess we're both busy. Um, we we want to try and write something together about the tithe and the impact of the tithe. Um, because believe me, like you, um, whether it's to locally Haiti or or any other you know connected um, initiative that a parish has, to me it just makes so much sense. And to hear Father Bruce say it actually helps the campaign, mm -hmm. I, mean, um, I, I do think to spread that idea makes a ton of sense for a ton of reasons. And that's true with us too, with our budget process too, with our outreach. Yes, Janet. Thank you for joining. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to I thank you all for coming today and for attending this workshop uh, for the pre-convention. These recordings will be uh, posted to the convention website at the on the diocesan website under the convention webpage. Um, so if you want to pass this uh, on to anyone else, you certainly can do that. We have another workshop that is about to start and we're in this same Zoom meeting. And I am so sorry, but I have to be the bad guy today and sort of ask you all if you could bring this to a close. Yeah. Thank you, Janet. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank Thanks you all for all being here. You. Thank you all. Thank you. You Thank are you. welcome. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.